Hello, everyone. In this video, we are chatting with Ms. Nancy Vargas, a PhD student in public health. Hi, Nancy. Hi, everyone. So, Nancy, can you introduce yourself and share your uh, profession, uh, your current employment, training, and any identities that you might have? All right. So, hi, everyone. Erin already mentioned my name, so I'm Nancy. Um, I'm actually a student here at Oregon State University. I was formerly a student at Cal State Fullerton, where I did my master's in public health. Um, formerly, I was also a student at UC Riverside, where I did my bachelor's in anthropology. And while I was there, I was also a bio sci major for three years, but my last year I changed it to anthropology um, for various reasons. Um, I am a first generation college student. I'm the first in my family um, to go past elementary school. And my native language is actually Spanish, so I know Spanish pretty well, and it's been a great asset in the work that I do. Um, in terms of the focus that I'm particularly interested in is Latino youth health and youth development, um, especially right now that I see a huge need in the state of Oregon. Um, Oregon is a predominantly white state, um, so there isn't as much diversity, and right now there is a huge need for the population that I aim to serve. Um, Let's see what else. Um, in terms of, you said career, correct? Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, I've had like a varying career path. So I started um, in education. So right after graduating, I was still trying to figure out kind of what I wanted, wanted to do. I've been volunteering as a peer health educator um, for three years in my undergrad. Mm -hmm. uh, I realized that's what I like doing, but I didn't really know what public health was because public health was not offered at my undergraduate university. Um, but I knew I loved the work that I did. I did a lot of um, sexual health education, drug prevention. Um, in the meantime, after graduating, I started working for a program called Think Together, which is an after-school education program. I was one of their former students um, as from kindergarten all the way through like 12th grade. Wow. Um, yeah, and so it was, I contacted the CEO and I was like, hey, I need a job. I just graduated. Do you have anything? He's like, yeah, I'll put you somewhere. Um, <laughs> actually, that was during my undergrad. Yeah, he had me do office work in the summer. And um, once I graduated, they offered me um, some work and I was doing work after school education. Um, and during that year, I actually applied to graduate school um, for Fullerton. And I also applied to a job at the time. Um, with the Orange County Department of Education doing drug prevention. And I remember seeing the posting and it was like $20 an hour. And I was like, there is no way I'm getting this job. I'm just a recent graduate in anthropology. Why would they, you know, pick me out of all these very experienced people? Um, you know, I just didn't feel I was very qualified for the position. Um, even though I met everything internally, I was just like, I don't think I'm going to get this. Why should I even apply? But I was like, I'll apply anyway. Um, I ended up getting the job. <laughs> um, me and my friend applied for the job. We were helping each other throughout the process. It was a multi-interview process. Wow. Um, and we helped each other. Sometimes I would have the first part of the interview. And for the like second interview, she had, the, she had it first. And we just helped each other throughout. Um, we had no idea they were actually looking to hire two people. And both of us were hired. Um, so helping each other out awesome. definitely, definitely paid off. Um, and yeah, I... I loved it. Like, um, the work that I did, uh, was definitely great. Um, it was drug prevention. I worked with schools. I had, we had over 30 something sites, um, in Orange County. And I love, I really loved the work that I did. It wasn't really going to schools. And usually when people think of drug prevention, they think of you go to schools, you tell, you know, kids, drugs are bad. Like, I don't know if, you know, in the past, I saw South Park. Now I see, like, how bad South Park is. But, you know, like, I forget the teacher's name, but there's a famous line where, like, drugs are bad or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that's how I view drug prevention. But I liked it in the sense that we were going to these schools and looking at and asking the youth, what are the problems that you're seeing in your own communities or the problems going on in your own schools? What do you think are the best ways to address this issue? It's not really me coming in saying like, this is what needs to be done. It's asking them, what do you think the issue is? How do you think, it, uh, what, it, what best way um, is there to address that specific issue going on, you know, locally or in your school? And they had such great ideas and it really um, highlighted the amount of 
uh, knowledge that the community had, especially the youth. Mm -hmm. And I love that type of work. And I really wanted to incorporate that work. Um, during that time, I was in, like I mentioned, in the master's program at Cal State Fullerton. And so I started teaching during that program only because I asked. I was like, hey, how can I teach? Um, or like, can I teach? Like, get me in there. You know, I want more experience. Um, and yeah, it's very untypical, I think, especially culturally in my culture. Uh, we don't ask for a lot of things, um, but I learned or and I saw that a lot of people that were getting ahead were asking for these things. So it was very uncomfortable for me, but I had to. And so I just asked. And usually through asking, a lot of stuff was given. Um, like, that's how I feel. <laughs> like, I always tell people, just ask. It never hurts to ask. They tell you no. It's, you know, a no. Um, and I ended up starting teaching online first, um, personal health at the time. Um, and then I started teaching in person and I got to teach it for a year and I figured out I loved it. At the same time, I was involved in research. Um, and I figured out that I loved it, especially when I found, um, like patterns in the data and I was just like, wow, like I'm seeing this, like, let me investigate this further. And so I knew I wanted to combine kind of all elements, working with the community, doing teaching, um, doing research. And I figured out, like, at that point, I was like, teaching, research, and service, who does this? It's like, you know, I, at that point, I was like, okay, I feel like I need to pursue my PhD. I love all these aspects. Um, and that's kind of like what led me towards um, a PhD program. Um, and while I was at Fullerton, I took full advantage of a lot of funding opportunities. So at Fullerton, at the time, I don't know what the state is now, but at the time, um, research uh, funding was very great. So sometimes even for networking or volunteering at some of these conferences that offered funding. Uh, we had funding not only through the department, we also had funding through the college, um, some sort of student committee. It's been a while. Uh, since I, yes. Uh, Inner Club Council, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, through there and also the Graduate Studies Office. Um, I found funding through there. And so almost all my trips were always paid for. The first conference I attended was the American uh, Society for Nutrition Conference in Boston. That was the first time I've ever traveled to any other state. Um, me and my family never, I mean, we traveled to like Mexico, um, but never outside of Southern California here in the U.S. Um, never been to NorCal, all these other places. Um, and yeah, so that was my first time traveling outside. And it was at, also at that conference that I decided that I really wanted to pursue a PhD also because I had so many questions and critiques sometimes about the research that was being done. And some people recognized um, that I had very valid points. Um, and I would introduce myself as a grad student and they're like, hey, have you heard about our PhD program? And they were there recruiting people, handing out flyers. And that's when I realized that I was wanted because that was the biggest concern I had that, you know, um, will anybody want me um, as a student in their program? Um, in the end, I think I ended up applying, I forget to how many programs. Um, it wasn't that many, I think, but I ended up getting into uh, San Diego State, a UCSD program. It's a joint program. Um, Oregon State, a University of Illinois in Chicago, and also Portland State University. I'm pretty sure those were the ones I got into. Um, mm -hmm. And in the end, I made my, um, my decision on multiple things, meeting faculty, um, seeing if it was, you know, a good fit, also distance. I love Chicago, but um, my family did not. They loved it. <laughs> I mean, sorry, they hated it. Mm -hmm. uh, they wanted something a little bit closer. They wanted me to go to San Diego, but um, San Diego didn't have uh, enough funding for me to feel comfortable going there. No guaranteed funding. Um, and each person in each case is actually going to be different. Um, so for one person, they might offer no funding. And for another person, they might offer uh, more funding, depending on who you're working for. Um, so it's going to vary. So I always tell people apply anyway. For me, they didn't. But for you, it just depends on who you're working for um, and if they have funding available. Um, for me, I was offered a diversity uh, fellowship through Oregon State University. Like I mentioned, it's a, it, the state is overall, oh, like overall demographically white. The institution is considered a um, P, uh, PWI? Yeah. yeah. Primarily white institution? No. Predominantly white. Oh, predominantly, yes, thank you. Predominantly white institution. 
Um, so one of their goals is to increase diversity. And I was one of the two people awarded that award. Um, or like overall in the whole, I guess, school. Wow. Uh, departments. Um, yeah, but it's come, just the title alone has come with, you know, some controversy from others. Mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, it should be based on merit, not diversity. Mm -hmm. um, but if you look at <laughs> some of the work that I've been doing, it's very extensive, especially in all aspects of teaching research and service. Um, I at least at the time of entering the university. So, I mean, I did feel it was based on merit, but obviously um, this, they wanted to set money aside to ensure to recruit the best um, diverse students available since they offered me, I believe, $30,000 my first year and I didn't have to do anything, um, no, not working. So pretty much they offered me $30,000. On top of that, they paid my tuition. So that 30000 was pretty Whoa. much my living. and That was the stipend. Yeah, so that was tuition plus thirty thousand dollars. Yes. Yeah. Wow. I learned a lot about taxes that year. <laughs> Let me tell you. <laughs> um, yeah. So that's one of the reasons I chose, and also meeting the faculty. Um, I was very fortunate to find funding to visit some of these schools through um, a program called Sally Casanova. So if you're um, actually, you might be eligible if you're an undergrad. Uh, so. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a program offered through uh, the CSU system, and you can apply to be a Sally Casanova Scholar if you're interested in graduate programs. Um, so I loved it because they paid for your school applications. So got some of my school applications paid for. Um, I could also travel and visit the schools. I had to put like a whole proposal saying what I was going to spend the money on mm. um, and your GRE exams, that, that type of stuff. So there was a lot of opportunities. It's just a matter of like, are you applying for them? Are you reaching out to people to get your letters of rec um, or LORs? People call them different things, <laughs> letters of recommendation. Um, yeah. And part of it is really putting yourself out there and asking for a lot of these things, like I mentioned before, which can be uncomfortable, especially like, I know, like my parents are very humble people. Um, it's always been like, you know, like in Spanish, they have this word, like, Callate, like, you know, quiet, like quiet, like don't raise your hand. Don't do, <laughs> don't say anything. Um, but I've learned that like in order for me to get ahead at least in these spaces that aren't um, representative of my people that I need to go beyond what is comfortable at least for right now until until some of these spaces kind of change to accommodate some of our people yeah wow thank you for sharing that was just hearing what you've gone through, it, it feels like it, it's been a long journey and a lot of work and a lot of trying out different spaces, but it, it's wonderful to hear how successful you've been um, by putting yourself out there and then just trying, even if maybe your initial gut reaction was like, I don't know if this is going to work, but I'm just going to try it. Anyways, yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, so... Can you tell us a little bit more? I mean, I, I know you kind of talked about your journey, but can you tell us more? What do you do and like, why do you do it? All right. So I mentioned earlier, I've been involved in all types. So um, this past year, I've been doing lots of teaching um, just based. They didn't have as many graduate research assistantships available. So I did a lot of teaching um, as part of teaching um it's one of the components i miss i mentioned teaching research and service so as part of teaching um i've been enrolled in the gcup program here on campus which is a graduate certificate in university and college teaching um one of my major things is we really need to utilize theory um in all aspects of the work that we do while i'm not an um, education major i'm interested in being the best teacher that i can um, i can possibly be um, and so one of those aspects is um, I really wanted to enroll in this program to learn more about the theory and the application of those theories to best inform um, my instructional, uh, I guess, strategies um, within the classroom. Um, and so that's something that I'm really, you know, passionate about. And I feel like overall my ratings have been pretty great, at least for one of my courses that I that I've been able to like change and evolve and it's ones discussing 
um, it's a course called Social Determinants of Health, and we go into a lot of topics, including um, race and gender and um, how those issues affect those communities. And so they're pretty in depth and obviously can be very controversial, but I really like it because I have a lot of firsthand examples um, that I can provide, especially coming from, you know, a low income family and an area that had a lot of, that has a lot of gang violence and where I work is in a rural, more, you know, rural area. And so um, we have students coming from urban areas as well, but they're not as familiar with like gang violence, shootings, you know, having friends die from um, gang violence and um, just highlighting the experiences, you know, I've grown up with and the ways people cope in these communities. And sometimes it's like maladaptive coping. So like uh, strategies. So sometimes drinking, drug use and like what I've seen. And so to them, sometimes it's a complete shock, um, especially if you compare um, the average median income, um, comparing even Fullerton to like this here, I think here, um, the median income might be $110,000. And I, I want to say Fullerton is a lot lower. I want to say it's between fifty to $70,000. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a huge change, especially for a lot of them to hear that the world isn't like the one they grew up in. Uh, but we do have very shared experiences sometimes because, you know, drugs go across <laughs> different um, borders, especially, or like income levels. Um, so sometimes the issues are affecting different levels, but a lot of them have highlighted how, like, how much they learned about different communities, um, just based through me being in the classroom, um, and also seeing the perspective of students of color and how they haven't had um, a person of color be the instructor. And so being grateful about that fact that I was able to provide um, a lot of perspectives that have been part of their personal experiences, but seeing them validated in the classroom setting uh, was very important for them. Um, so I mentioned teaching, also research. Um, I was talking to Erin earlier about the research that I'm currently doing. So I mentioned GRAs or graduate research assistantships are very rare, um, at least in our program right now. There's not as many, but thankfully uh, my uh, my current boss, he got a grant from the Robert Johnson Foundation. Um, so it's a very well-known foundation if you're in the field of public health. Um, so as part of that work, um, it was a special grant that they were submitting for where they wanted to take international ideas and adapt them here in the U.S. So it's a, pro so it's a program um, that they're adapting from Brazil and the program I forget the official title, but it pretty much, I described it in my bio. Um, it's a program to train Latino youth as LGBTQ um, allies um, for, la for Latinos. Um, so they're adapting that program and we're gonna adapt it here in Oregon, which I think is very interesting considering we're gonna be targeting Latinos and Latinos here are very rural. And so that's gonna be a new experience for me because a lot of people think because I'm Latina, I'm gonna be able to work with this population so easily. Um, but I already see problems um, in regards to outreach and engagement and getting parents to have their kids participate in this program, especially since it's very rural and very Catholic communities. I grew up Catholic, but I also didn't grow, grow up, you know, from a rural area. I grew up in a very urban area, so it's a very different experience. Um, so I'm excited, like, just knowing that it's so different and there's going to be problems, but at the same time, I'm just like, I'm excited to address these problems and just add um, to the skills that I'm gonna be able to have once I finish uh, the program. Um, and as part of uh, my research, I'll actually be traveling to Brazil uh, this December. Um, we're taking a team um, from Portland called Outside the Frame. Um, and what we're gonna be, develop what we're gonna be doing, um, or they're gonna be doing, uh, is gonna be developing telenovelas, which are like soap operas. Uh, so these are gonna be the narratives of, um, we're gonna hire actors, but the scripts are gonna be provided um, by a group of um, diverse, um, a diverse team um, of different, like the actors have to be, in terms of requirements, they have to be Latino, ideally LGBTQ uh, or an ally. Um, and they're gonna be developing the script um, and making these telenovelas or soap operas and these are going to be the ones that we're going to be showing in the program um, or in the program that we're going to be piloting. 
Um, so right now we're traveling with the team to Brazil to learn more about the work there they're doing and um, looking at uh, Paulo Frieri work and if you haven't read their work um, they're very well known in the field of education um, definitely read his work um, I've read their work lots of times especially being now in more in the education realm um, I love it I'm very drawn <laughs> uh, to his particular work um, but I'm excited you know going to Brazil I was like I just got hired for this job and they're like you're going to Brazil do you have a passport mm -hmm. one week later I respond I'm like it's on its way. <laughs> um, yeah, so I haven't traveled in a while, so I'm really excited about that and getting to work with people that have experience doing videos and learning more about that and just really learning about the community that has developed this program since um, as part of this grant, you know, they, we want to have a intercultural exchange of information. And so as part of the work that we're going to be doing while we're there is learning more about their uh, their work and learning about the work that um that we do here and also about the volunteer work that i've been doing because we're going to be piloting the program um with 4-h which is an organization uh, it's a nationwide organization um it's an organization i've been volunteering for over hundreds and hundreds of hours and that's how i ended up getting this job just because i've been volunteering for them and they're like hey, um, Dr. Garcia, we think Nancy would be a good fit. She's already volunteering for us. She's within your college. Hire her. <laughs> and so that's how I ended up with the job. So um, volunteering pays off in different ways, not only for personal fulfillment, but it provided lots of networking opportunities where now I have connections to like a district attorney here locally. So I'm like, if I ever get into trouble, <laughs> I definitely call. Hopefully I'm there. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I've had lots of networking opportunities. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited. And like, I, you know, I feel like I highlighted all three aspects of like, excited about teaching, uh, excited about the work that I'm currently doing, um, especially it's a new realm, LGBTQ youth, but involves lat um, Latinos. So I'm just like, I'm excited about anything Latino oriented. Um, but yeah, I'm really excited about it. And service wise, it allows me to continue doing service with the population um, and the program that I've been working with, which is a, a 4 age. It used to be called Latino Outreach. Um, that's why it started because the person who started the program uh, was focused on Latinos. Right now we're working on, we changed our name to uh, 4 age Outreach um, because we've seen that there's a greater need within the general uh, community as we've been building our network. Um, we've been seeing that you know, it's not only Latinos, a lot of rural white youth also need a lot of these, um, a lot of this helps so as part of the program or the outreach program I'm involved in. We do three different workshops throughout the year. We do a fall one where it's um, like call it some sort, I forget the official titles because I don't have them off the top of my head, um, but helping them with college applications, resumes, uh, personal mm -hmm. statements, that type of information. We have a spring one called Youth Voices in Action where we take them to the Capitol. We learn more about Capitol processes um, and invite them to be uh, more engaged in the civic process. And then spring, we have career exploration. And then the summer, we have uh, summer camps that we run for youth and they're multicultural summer camps because we really believe that um, a lot of youth, this is going to be their first time, you know, experiencing other people that may not look like them. Um, and in order for them to be uh, to succeed in college, they need to be able to work with people of differing identities, not only ethnically, but, you know, gender wise, um, sexuality wise, like what it's just different identities and we want to make sure they're college ready. So we feel um, this work that I'm doing this research that we're that we're doing in terms of training LGBT youth allies. Um, can be we've actually that's one of my part of my engagement strategies in getting parents to be willing to have their youth learn about being an ally in the LB LGBT population is to have it framed as college readiness because I feel like it mm -hmm. falls into line. I'm like, you need to be able to work with diverse people um, in order for you to succeed in college. If not, you know, you're not gonna make it and same goes for the workplace. Uh, you need to be, be able to work with diverse populations in the workplace. If not, you're not going to make it very far or you're not going to collaborate as well as you should, be, you should, I guess. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. And, and it's really, I think it's, it's really creative to have that angle of, okay, 
well, we're talking about how to be an ally to the queer community, but we're going to frame this as college readiness. Like that just makes so much sense. But I, don't, I think people don't really think about those as being directly related. Yeah, because um, I mentioned before that, I mean, I do expect problems, especially since we're working with, um, you know, very conservative Catholic rural Latino communities and seeing, you know, one of the beliefs they might potentially have is, you know, if they learn about LGBT uh, Q population, like it just means that they're encouraging people, you know, to be gay. I'm like, no, like either they are, or they aren't. Um, you know, it's not like they're we're gonna present our presentation suddenly, like, you know, <laughs> they're gonna <laughs> they're gonna be like, oh, this is me now. Um, well, although it may help them if they are trying to process their own identity. Yeah, but I mean, it, it's not gonna like change. Yeah. Yeah, it's already something that's existent. Yeah. Uh, they might know the terminology to know what to call it at that point. Um, but yeah, I, at least for me right now, that's one of my potential like primary, um, I guess, engagement strategies. We're trying to come up with different things, like how can we make sure to involve people? Cause I, I do see that as a potential, um, issue that we might have to like address but i feel like that's a good one since i frame um the camps that way when i'm like you know bring your kids yes it's multicultural might seem a little <laughs> different especially you know if their schools aren't diverse but how can we um ensure that we get you know a wide array of identities and where for we uh, the first couple years we focused on just racial but we're really um expanding as well, um, besides racial identities, trying to get gender and um, gender different gender identities, and seeing how we're going to work that within our program. Since a lot of the work used to be very like gender, um, like male female, like female sleep here, male sleep here. Since it's uh, summer camps, mm -hmm. well, I mean, we're as we do the work and see um, everything that you know has been changing, and we're changing as. Um, our organization is growing. Um, so I feel like that's something that everyone needs to do, whatever, you know, place you're working at is you need to change as the environment changes, as the culture changes. Um, that's the only way the organization can continue to like succeed overall. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you touched on a lot about uh, intersectionality, right? And to say that you're interested in um, health issues of the Latino community, that means that you're also interested in gender issues and LGBTQ issues and, you know, a variety of things, right? Because people exist in multiple uh, spaces and, and, and just because you are one uh, cultural or ethnic background doesn't mean that you aren't also part of a different like gender or sexual orientation or immigration status or income level and all these different things. So it, it's, it's great to hear that you are um, addressing, um, addressing identity from multiple perspectives. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Um, so I think you've already talked about your career path thus far. Um, can you share what area of public health you are in and maybe why you're interested in that? Um, I'm trying to think like, how do I frame this? Um, in terms of area of public health, I mean, I'm in a specific track here at Oregon State. Um, it's called health, per I'm probably butchering this, health promotion and health behavior. Um, it's either that or it's switched around. I always get it confused because of my time in Cal State Fullerton. Um, so that's a specific area, but like I mentioned, um, I'm interested in Latino adolescent health, but also on youth development. I see them going hand in hand sometimes. Um, people in my field have a bit of trouble understanding how education is closely tied to public health. Um, yeah, I've received a, so, you know, some backlash here and there regarding that. They're like, that's more education research. Um, but at the same time, seeing how education is a leading health um, indicator um, and how education helps reduce, you know, different types of uh, negative health behaviors um, and seeing, you know, how it does affect that. Um, I feel like they do go hand in hand. And part of my work in youth development is also uh, providing some of those skills and resources that some of the youth need. I mean, also tapping into their own um, uh, 
resources that they have within their community and within themselves um, to address the work that can be done within their communities as well. Um, I guess that's the area of public health I'm in. Um, I don't know if you want to know anything more. No, that, that makes sense. Um, and, and I think it is good to see that even within something like health promotion, health behavior, um, there are different areas of interest that you might have. And, and I think particularly with public health, it can be very interdisciplinary where, uh, like what you, what, with what you said, a lot of what you do could also be considered education, but I think if you take a public health perspective of like health and all policies, right, everything that you do is going to impact your health. Yeah. Right? So how do we approach um, something like education with that perspective that this is going to influence their health? And so how can we do this in, in, in the best way to encourage them to uh, have a healthy life later on, right? So. Yeah, I, I firmly believe that education and public health are like, you know, so intertwined. Um, so what do you think is the best part about um, being in public health? Um, in terms of being in public health, I don't know, it's just, there's a lot. Um, I find a lot of personal fulfillment in the work that I do. Um, I've mentioned before in some other talks that I've given. So I went in as an undergrad, um, I, at the time UC Riverside, I went as in a biological sciences major. I was really pre-med, I'm like, I'm gonna be an oncologist, um, hematologist, like this is what I wanna do. Um, I did it for three years through the physics series, O-chem series, chem series, bio series. If y'all are in that field, y'all know how much of a struggle that was. <laughs> I finished them. Um, I volunteered at the hospital for three years at my local community hospital at the time. Um, I volunteered there for so long and I honestly didn't like it. Um, I internalized a lot of things um, and seeing death and seeing, you know, those type of things. I get very close to people really easily. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't like it. I, I was like, I could not deal with the death. I mean, there was happy moments even uh, working like labor and delivery, you know, seeing babies being born, um, but also anytime death came around, I was just like, this is not, this is not the work that I want to do. And yes, I could have been more, you know, primary care, not the hospital. Um, but I realized like, you know what, this isn't really, I don't see myself doing this. And um, I remember taking a course on gender, I think gender, race, and medicine. Um, and I remember completely like, I like this and eventually ended up changing. Um, yeah. yeah. And from then, from then on, I realized um, that I, and the volunteer work I did, that I found a lot of personal fulfillment in the prevention aspect. Um, and I knew it was going to be make a lot less money. Um, <laughs> but yeah, ended up getting like a great job um, right after graduating it paid well when I left actually I think they recruited when I left the salary went up I was going to be offered a lot more money and I still left so <laughs> I was going to be offered probably close to like sixty thousand dollars and for a government organization wow. they pay uh there's a lot of really great benefits I worked for the Orange County Department of Education have a lot of um I think retirement benefits. I don't know exactly what it's called. I should, I should be more well-versed in a lot of these things, but everybody that had been working there usually works there, you know, for life. <laughs> yeah, for life. Um, yeah. The pay was great also because one of the, what I liked about that job is that re they really wanted to retain people. So um, if you want to retain people, you have to pay them better. <laughs> um, but even then, like, even when I was, cause at the time I was in my, master's program I was working part-time but at $20 an hour you know that meant I didn't have to work that much um in comparison to like if I had a job that paid a lot less like you know at the time it would have been like $10 for minimum wage mm -hmm. um so it was a great balance I could work and especially Cal State Fullerton's program it allowed me to work in the way that it was structured um yeah so fulfillment was like the really I think the biggest part of my occupation, like I love the fulfillment in, um, in teaching, seeing students understand something or seeing how, you know, I explain something or I change some, some, um, their perspective on certain things. Um, I'm pretty well versed in 
working and differing, working with people from differing politic, political identities. Um, since actually I've been differing political identities because of uh, how I grew up when I was younger and how my views have changed over time. Um, so I'm able to navigate a lot of these different spaces. Um, so I take a lot of fulfillment and, you know, sometimes switching like a light bulb in somebody or sometimes I know I mentioned the political parties because I had a specific incident where we were talking about housing discrimination and somebody always mentioned their personal political party as their, the reason for thinking a particular way. I'm like, well, technically libertarians are against fair housing laws because that's government intervention. And um, I explained why. And they're like, I don't think that's the case because I would be against it. And so we, I highlighted the fact that like, you need to own up to your own beliefs and not associate them to your party because sometimes you're not going to agree with them. And that's the same for me where, you know, sometimes my personal beliefs are not going to align with the party that, you know, that I identify as. So we need to be, um, we need to acknowledge which ones are our own personal beliefs. And so sometimes seeing those kind of like learning moments in the class, I think have been amazing. Um, in terms of research, like I mentioned, finding patterns and seeing um, the, the potential or not the potential, but like seeing what you could do with your findings and how they can be used in the future to improve, you know, a specific program or develop a program. Um, sorry, you hear my cat in the background. <laughs> Um, she's been pretty quiet <laughs> overall also the people that I've been meeting in my program um, all the networking that I've done and um, just meeting different people uh, in the community as well I think that's my biggest thing is uh, the community aspect so meeting a lot of the youth that I potentially might uh, tap into um, so I mentioned service as a big part I see that as part of my occupation um, if you're going to be in academia, you usually do service. And so I mentioned in my, I think in my bio, I mentioned being on the committee uh, for um, Fullerton uh, as part of like the admissions. Uh, admissions, thank you. I'm like, I just remember applications, seeing lots and lots of applications. Um, that counts as service. So if you're going to be interested in academia, you have to do all those three components, teaching, research, and service. And service can be, you know, sitting on a board somewhere in the community. Um, like I think uh, our previous chair, uh, Dr. T, I think was, did stuff for like Susan G. Komen, I want to say. Um, so stuff like that. Um, that also counts as service. So that could be, you know, partnering with another organization or like the volunteer work I do with the 4-H outreach program here. Um, so if you see yourself in academia, you really need to see yourself doing those three things. And some people actually go into a PhD and they don't see themselves doing teaching. Um, they really see the research aspect, which is great. Um, so they might end up working at like, you know, a think tank um, where they don't have to do some of those things. So, <laughs> <you can. laughs> yeah, so, I mean, there's various uh, things. I'm like laughing at the same time. There's various things you like, if you do get a PhD, you don't need to be a professor or, you know, work in academia. Um, there's other, other avenues that people take. Sometimes, you know, people work in labs, depending on what they're doing behind a computer um, looking at like data. I mean, it, it just really depends um, what, pe what people's best skills are. Um, and I feel like I do a little bit of everything. <laughs> um, and so that's kind of like what I like that I, so I do have a short attention span for people that know me. Um, and I also talk a lot in case y'all haven't noticed how much I talk. Um, so I do a lot of community engagement. I love meeting people. Um, and it really provides me with a varied amount of tasks um, so I don't get bored easily, um, which is definitely something that people um, mention. And especially when I take classes that I know, um, I can get bored very easily. And I've been able to adapt in terms of, because um, school has been a struggle in that sense ever since I was young, younger, since I have problems paying attention here and there. Um, but I feel like it is a perfect job in the sense that there's a lot of multitasking involved which I like. Yeah, yeah. It's great to hear that being in public health and in academia, like you have so many things that you are um, excited about and, and you view 
so many things as the best part of, of yeah. being part of this job. Um, on the flip side, what do you think has been the most challenging part? I think, well, it's, it can, it, I was just writing about this the other day uh, when I was writing a letter of support for someone. And I think the hardest part, especially for most PhD students, um, something that doesn't get discussed a lot is mental health within the PhD programs. Um, so there is very high rates of depression. I'm not exactly sure about suicide, but you know, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, the PhD programs can be very isolating. Thankfully, um, I know a lot of these stats and figures. And so for me coming in, um, I knew what the issues potentially could be and ways that I could potentially address them. Mm. So in terms of, I think that's the most challenging part. And most people will tell you that depression, stress from, you know, symptoms, how rigorous, you know, the classes might be. Um, for me, A, I started visiting, visiting CAPS right away, um, especially because at the time we had a current um, change in um, administration um, and certain issues came about regarding, you know, race issues and me being in the classroom at a predominantly white institution. Um, and I knew right away, you know, I started scheduling uh, CAPS appointments, which are counseling and psychological services. So I would go in, talk about any issues that were going, how, you know, I was being affected by this administration, being a new student, my, at the time it was my first year here, you know, in the state of Oregon. Um, so I started visiting them, talking about my issues. I had a white therapist, but you know, she was great. Very acknowledging about her own personal identities um, and you know, how she, and she acknowledged them, which I thought was great as a provider. Um, and you know, I, I loved her and I always tell people I, I've done counseling before and Sometimes it's not a great fit with her. It was. So I always tell people, keep trying until you find somebody that you know you can work with, um, especially if it's something you highly need. So I did CAPS. Um, another part that I tell people when you're engaging in these spaces that can be very isolating is to really find a community. At the master's program, it was a bit easier, especially at Fullerton, since we were very cohort oriented. Um, here, you know, some of the PhD students, you know, they have families, they have other things. Here I am, me living the single life with, you know, my cat, as you saw earlier. Um, they had a lot less time to hang out versus me. I was just like, you know, I was thinking it was going to be like my master's program. Like, we're going to be hanging out with my cohort. No, a lot of people, you know, are just really busy. Um, I mean, so was I, but um, they just had a lot of other, you know, priorities. Um and so for me, the biggest thing was finding my community. And so that's how I started volunteering. Uh, my advisor connected me to uh, my man called Mario Magaña, who was in charge of the 4-H outreach program here. Um, and he got me involved and I got to know a lot of people. Um, even I remember just talking to him and I knew I wanted to volunteer with him right away because of how helpful and how willing he was to do anything for the community. Um, I mentioned something about moving. He's like, well, if you need help, let me know, you know, I'll bring my truck. I'll do. And that just reminded me so much of, you know, the people from my community and the, how much, um, how community oriented we are. Um, and so for me, I was like, I know I want to volunteer for this person. And so if he ever calls and he's like, you know, uh, we have a last minute, like giving away turkeys or, you know, for like Thanksgiving, he's like, can you come? We just got a delivery, a donation. I'll be like, yes, I'll be right there. Um, only because I know they're also willing to do the same for me. Um, and I've been invited to a lot of community members' houses to celebrate um, certain celebrations like Thanksgiving, the holidays, if I'm here. They're, it's really great seeing how much um, the community has rallied around um, the students here at OSU, especially the ones that, are vol that help serve some of their youth. Um, and seeing how much... I guess how greatly accepted I've been into, you know, this community, even I know we're all, most of us are Latino um, working for this particular program, but obviously I met, um, we're different Latinos in terms of differing identities. Um, me being from urban and, you know, them being from rural and more conservative Catholic. I grew up Catholic, but I'm a non-practicing Catholic, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and so being accepted by this community, and I think that's something that I think has uh, that has addressed the challenging part of, you know, being in academia, being a, 
in, in a PhD program where it can be very isolating, um, especially around issues of like being an imposter in academia. So the imposter syndrome, where it's like, you know, did I get admitted on a mistake? Like, mm-hmm. like, you know, I fooled them into like admitting me and I wasn't qualified. Like y'all just, you know, uh, you. Y'all just <laughs> fooled you. Um, and so sometimes having those moments of, you know, do I really belong here? But once in a while, I do get reminded, like, I really do, especially when highlighting, just bringing in stuff from n- my community knowledge, where I'm just like, wow, like, y'all didn't know this. Sometimes it's not in books yet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like being from the community and knowing these things. Um, one example I have is somebody was talking about measuring um, unhealthy foods in I think the Bay Area I'm not familiar with the Bay Area but Mm -hmm. I was like okay like you know how can I draw from my Southern California experience uh, working with Latinos and I was talking about um, I'm like what are you gonna do about like mobile food carts like eloteros paleteros like the corn man the popsicle man um, the ice cream trucks uh, the shaved ice men that come around in like little shopping carts um, in a lot of these like Latino urban um, areas and they're like, wow, I've never heard of those. And I was just like, well, like, that's just knowledge that, you know, that if you're from the community, you know, and if you're not, it's a bit more um, difficult. So I think it really highlighted the fact that people from the community also need to be in academia as well. Um, and also to help inform um, a lot of the research processes, stuff that maybe people don't know, but also to highlight the importance of including community members, not, not only community members in, you know, not only including me as like the Latina um, in a lot of the work, but I'm like, no, I don't know everything. So y'all need to go straight to the community <laughs> and mm-hmm. ask them, um, especially since uh, once you have an academic title or an academia, you lose trust within um, your own communities. Um, just because, you know, you represent an institution, uh, which sometimes the communities have a mistrust of. Yeah, I I know that was a lot. (laughs) Yeah, but I mean, I think it, I think it makes sense um, kind of hearing, you know, what the challenges have been um, as a PhD student and, you know, everything always happens like in context, right? Like for you to not just be a a PhD student, but to be moving out of state and to being in a different environment and you're in a certain certain political environment, right? Um, All the way down to, you know, what what knowledge do you bring that might be different from um, other folks that frequently isn't, valued in the same way as some other forms of knowledge, right? Um, and so I, I think that's one of the things that um, at my job um, in, in the Health Careers Opportunity Program, Allied Health Academy, we, we try to encourage students to think about what their um, community cultural wealth is, right? Like what are the, what are the assets and, and the strengths that people are bringing to these spaces that have traditionally not um, brought them to the table? Right. And so I think that's the perfect segue to my question about how um, culture and language has been influencing um, the type of work that you've seen. Um, In terms of how it's influenced it, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think all public health uh, takes into into account somewhat. Um, Some do a better job of it than others. I I definitely have examples. I know from, I mentioned earlier, going to a Boston conference, American Society for Nutrition conference. Um, They, I mean, they took it, they were developing a program for Latinos um, in the East Coast, particularly, um, I want to say either Dominicans or Puerto Ricans. um, And they wanted to, you know, have a program um, that was meant for this, the Latino population. And uh, the population that they targeted was mostly Dominicans and Puerto Ricans. Um, so like I mentioned, it matters a lot, especially if done correctly. If not, um, there definitely needs to be a lot more research sometimes done. So with that particular example, um, 
somebody was presenting research on it and I was just flabbergasted in terms of how did this even get this far only because I saw the recipe book they developed for the community and it was like enchiladas, chile rellenos and like all stuff. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I said that in like, no, I should have said enchiladas, chile rellenos. Um, so it was a lot of recipes that were Mexican recipes. Um, and even I know also from having friends that are from different Latino identities. Um, so I, my parents are Mexican, so I know a lot of uh, Mexican um, cultural like foods and traditions. Um, I knew, I'm like, y'all, they don't eat spicy. So I don't know, like a lot of these recipes are higher on the spicy scale. Mm -hmm. um, and at least the friends I had, you know, they would eat plantains, sweet plantains with their food, not spicy whatsoever. And so they mentioned about how the community said they didn't like the recipes. And I'm like, yeah, I could, I could have told you that ahead of time. Um, you're adapting, you know, traditional Mexican recipes, making them healthier, and then get, trying to have, you know, pe other people um, eat them. Um, and so... I think it matters a lot. They always try to take it into account, but there's different, different ways um, that it definitely can be done. I mentioned earlier, um, just because you're working with the Latino population, um, if you have somebody that's academic and that's uh, Latino, it doesn't necessarily uh, mean that they have the best uh, knowledge or interests of the community that they might be serving. Um, and that's something I've mentioned as something in my class where I'm like, how would you feel if I was serving as, as a board representing, you know, the Latinos here of Oregon and I know nothing. I, I mean, now I know some things, but I'm like representing like rural Oregon Latino people. How would y'all feel? And asking Latino students, they felt uncomfortable saying it, but they're like, I wouldn't feel comfortable as you like serving. I'm like, yes, that's correct. Because I don't represent y'all and I don't know your experiences. And so that's why I highlight the fact that when you're doing a lot of this work, really include your own community members um, that you're trying to serve. Um, in terms of other things that I've seen, um, I don't know if some of y'all are familiar with the term code switching. I know it's been a very beneficial aspect um, for me and working with the community um, where I'm able to, I don't know ex exactly how to define code switching, but I know like I'm able to navigate a lot of these spaces and change the way I talk and speak um, based on the spaces I'm navigating. Um, so some, one of the things I didn't mention earlier was like, I guess, I don't know what the correct terminology is, but because I am from it, I can say it. So like, I'm from the hood. So like, I can also <laughs> talk um, in more of using more urban language um, and more lay language as like, you know, academic professionals might say. Um, so that what community members might typically use um, in those specific areas. And so it's been a very beneficial aspect in terms of using that in the field, um, especially when we're trying to develop materials. So like if I'm developing materials, something called like informed consent. So, you know, do you agree to be part of this research? So we have to get people's permission based on a lot of historical aspects in terms of research being done wrong on communities of color, especially, or uh, marginalized communities such as the disabled. Um, developing materials and taking in language into account, making sure, you know, is it at least um, minimally like eighth grade reading level? Like that's, you know, uh, what it should be, or I mean, I guess maximum eighth grade reading level. Uh, can people read this, understand this? So, I mean, language definitely does influence um, the, f the field. Uh, we want to make sure people understand the work that we're doing. Um, I do think there still needs to be a lot of work done in regards to research, since a lot of the results that are published um, are very academic. And so um, there's something a coin termed, um, I don't know if it's termed by him, um, but I've heard it in his class when I took a class with him at Cal State Fullerton. Um, his name was Scott. I forget his last name. He's from Apiopa. Scott Chan, yeah. Apiopa is now uh, Asian Pacific Islander Forward Movement. Oh, yes. I remember they changed the, the name. Yes. Yeah. So I remember this was actually mentioned in um, 
our other video too. So Scott's getting two shout outs. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the other person, by the way? Uh, Dr. John Bresky. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So um, one of the things he highlighted, because I really like the term helicopter research. So going into these communities and, you know, um, drawing all of this information out and, you know, going in and then leaving them, like kind of leaving them, you know, uh, I always forget expressions. Something about hanging to dry. I forget the expressions. Yeah. Uh, I'm probably saying it wrong. Um, but like leaving them and not really giving them results or doing anything. Like you publish your work and there it is. Don't, um, you don't really put in the time. Um, and so that's something I've always kept in mind that like if we do the work that we're doing, how can we make it the results accessible to the community or get them out there? Mm -hmm. um, since my focus is a lot on the community and always keep the community in mind, um, I really want to make sure that we really include the community throughout the process from the beginning all the way, you know, to the end and the, res the results that we're publishing and making sure that the community can understand all the work that they did and also thanking them for allowing us to do the work in their community. Um, and that's why I've also been volunteering so much. It sounds like a lot of work, um, which it has been. But if I'm going to be doing research on Latino youth, I need to gain the community's trust. I need to gain the parents' trust. Um, and hopefully, eventually, I get to tap into some of those resources, um, especially when it comes to, when it comes to uh, doing my dissertation. Um, so I feel like I've built a strong network. I know at the beginning, it was a bit frowned upon. They're like, why are you you know, volunteering so many hours, you should be focused mm -hmm. on your coursework. I mean, I've been doing great, but I know they're always concerned, <laughs> especially with the amount of hours, but I'm like, I see the long-term vision. Um, a, it helps me mental health wise, find my community. B, this is what I probably will use for my dissertation. Latinos are hard to find here in Oregon. Mm -hmm. So, and I know as part of our, you know, the Latino culture, building trust is essential. And like that, uh, there's a term called personalismo, like a friendliness, uh, um, knowing about their own personal lives. Um, and some of that trust and friendship and camar camaraderie needs to be built uh, within the community before they allow me to really go in. Um, and, al and also like those essential gatekeepers within the community, uh, making sure that, you know, I get the okay from them. Um, to do the work that I'm doing and that can take a while. So I've been working on it since the beginning um, My first year here and now I'm in my third year So I feel like I have a pretty good standing and that they might let me do a lot of the work that I'm doing That's awesome um, For the sake of time, we'll just uh, switch now to a student question. Yeah um, So we did get a few questions um, I, I'll give you a moment to kind of read through what I sent. Is there one that kind of sticks out to you that you'd like to respond to? Um, let's see. Um, I'd probably say the there's probably a lot of people interested in, because I feel like I answered the first one a little bit on working with other individuals besides Latinos, especially with my work for age for expanding. We just need to have more diverse populations, but I feel like most people are more diverse uh, work staff before we reach out uh, to some of these other populations. Um, I feel like a lot of students are probably really interested in advice for applying to a master's in public health or any program for that matter that y'all are, you know, potentially developing applications for. Um, since I served on the admissions committee, there's lots of different things. Um, like I mentioned earlier, do not be afraid in applying and thinking that you're not worthy enough. Um, sometimes it, you might be accepted one year and you might not, you know, um, or I mean, not one year and then the next year, it's like you're the perfect fit. fit. It just depends on um, the application pool, who's applying, um, and how many people they're taking. So I would definitely just say just apply and, you know, um, see what happens. If you get in, you get in. If you don't, you don't. Um, my GRE scores were not that great, to be honest, um, which is not – I mean, which is very typical, I think, um, since I feel like standardized tests. Um, there's some sort of biases here and there, I think. 
um, in terms of how these tests are developed. Um, yeah, and so I usually say, even if your GRE scores aren't so great, I would still say apply, especially if you have other strong points within your application. I know at Fullerton, we looked at a very holistic aspect, meaning we looked at your entire application. One thing was not going to, you know, this is an automatic, you know, dismissal. It's like, let's look at the whole package overall. Um, in terms, other advice I have is um, personal statement. I personally, I liked people that highlighted some of their personal struggles and how they were able to overcome them. Um, definitely one of the biggest mistakes I've seen is sob stories. Um, so there's a difference between personal struggles. Um, like, you know, I, for me, I talked about, um, one of my parents struggles with addiction, um, and how that affected me and the work that I was going to do. Um, but I've seen some personal statements where they talked about, you know, X, Y, and Z happened, and everything's just getting worse as you read through the whole letter um, or personal statement. But there's nothing, it really needs to be focused, usually particular maybe on one personal struggle, and then expand on how that influenced your passion for, you know, the whatever field you're interested in. Um, so definitely, you know, don't make it about, you know, all these sob stories that you've had. I've had so many, but usually I pick one or two, and that's you know, that's what I'm going to focus on. And the rest is going to be focused on my experience, my accomplishments, what I've learned, um, and where I see myself going in the future with this degree. Like, what am I going to do with this? Um, those are usually the biggest mistakes I've seen, um, especially for resumes, people not describing um, the work that they're doing within an organization. It might be a lot of work that they're doing, but you only describe, you know, I've been a volunteer for this organization for you know, two years. So I'm like, great. What'd you do though? Like, you know, were you just doing like filing? Were you doing community engagement? Um, what was your role? So really going in and describing um, what you were doing definitely helps. Um, when you go get letters of recommendation, make sure you ask your people that you're asking to write letters for you. Can you write me an excellent letter of recommendation? If they say no, do not use that person. Um, definitely on the admissions committee, I've seen letters that have not been great, which surprises me because for me as an instructor, if I'm not going to write a good letter recommendation, I would tell that student no. Um, but that's not, that's not everyone's personal philosophy. Um, so for me, it was very unfortunate seeing um, negative letters of recommendation or you know, I'm not really sure about the student. I don't know them, but they've got a name my course. Um, those are not strong letters. Um, so for me, I would definitely say if, definitely say that, that can you write me an excellent letter of recommendation? If they can't, I would try to look elsewhere um, if possible, just because like I mentioned, I have seen those letters and especially letters I think can definitely, uh, if they're negative, they can definitely uh, have a negative effect on you uh, getting in. Um, so I think those would be some of my, I guess, main key tips since I talked about personal statements, resumes, and your, you know, uh, letters of recommendation. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nancy. I feel like you are a, a wealth of knowledge and experiences. And it, uh, sorry, y'all. No, this is more watching for y'all. <laughs> it's been amazing, though. I, I feel like there's so much. Um, that can be uh, learned from your experiences um, going through different jobs as well as um, your volunteer work, um, your experiences in academia. And then I think it does help, right? Because you you were formerly a, a Titan here at Cal State Fullerton. And so you, you know what um, the environment's like and you know what resources are available and you know what the admissions committee is looking for. Yeah. Um, so. <laughs> I'm like, I can't give specific details, but I mean, obviously, it is a holistic aspect, but um, if y'all are applying to the program, definitely reach out, you know, to Aaron, to other people, um, even me, if I'm available, feel free to reach out. Um, if any of y'all are really interested in, um, I used to do recruitment for them. <laughs> so hence why I know um, a lot about the program and I got, I've gotten a lot of people in. 
um, even recently that have been like, oh, I've been accepted, can I get more information? So-and-so referred me. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to contact me. I believe my bio has my contact information. Um, so always feel free to contact me if any of y'all have additional questions. Um, if you wanna talk over the phone, Skype, just email. I'm open to whatever uh, y'all need. And um, I'm always interested in forming um, new opportunities, new friendships, um, and potential networking because y'all might be important people someday. <laughs> um, honestly, that's how I view it. I'm like, it's surprising how many of y'all might end up in really important positions where I, I might be helping you today, but um, you might need to help me tomorrow. Yeah, awesome. Well, thank you so much and good luck with the rest of your PhD program. Uh, thank you again for speaking to our students. Thank you.